संस्थापकाय धर्मस्य सर्वधर्मस्वी अवतार वरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णाय ते नम so as i understand according to this program the main topic is uh, srimad bhagavatam a blend of knowledge and devotion gyan and bhakti and today's uh, discussion is journey from belief to experience in bhakti and gyan see kind of an introduction so at the very beginning i want to speak just a few words about the the place of or the relevance of bhagavatam as a scripture in the vedantic hindu tradition so it is one of the puranas is called one of the mahapuranas so if you just look at the uh, the canonical tradition of vedanta hinduism there are three main streams in our tradition one is shruti smruti and puranas shruti stands for vedas and smruti really literally smruti the smruti uh, when we try to interpret the basic fundamental vedic or vedantic principles of life according to changing times changing situations then certain new rules and regulations are put in place such books are called smritis more or less let us say ancient constitutions there are altogether 18 smritis and altogether there are four vedas rigveda yajurveda samaveda and atharveda these are the four vedas which actually constitute the very primary the most important authentic scriptures of hinduism and vedanta so if you have any conflict between certain ideas of puranic rituals or conventions mentioned in the puranic literature mythological books and what is mentioned in the vedas then we are expected to ignore the views of the puranas and we are expected to uphold the views of the vedas so the great uh, writers of smriti literature and also the author of all the 18 mahapuranas and upanishads mythological books have clearly stated that whenever there is a conflict between certain beliefs customs and habits and conventions and the fundamental teachings of the vedas we should ignore the puranas and the mythological books and uphold the views of the veda vedanta swami vivekananda once said that one uh, in for one cause of most of the problems of indian culture or vedantic tradition was we that we give more importance to the mythological stories than the vedantic and vedantic principles i shall give an example there are many rituals many uh, contemporary practices which uh, are different from province to province within india see what is relevant and what is practiced in one part of india is not practiced in another part so how do we decide what is authentic what is relevant if it is mentioned in the vedas it is relevant if it is not mentioned in the vedas or vedanta then it is only a, a provincial or regional convention so i can quote one important statement from vyasa himself who is the author of the bhagavata purana and also who is the author of all the mythological books puranas and mahapuranas shruti smruti purananam virodho yatra drushyate tatra sraudam pramanam sya tayur dvaithi smruti vara vyasa in case vyasa smruti makes a statement if there is a conflict between the teachings of the puranas and the teachings of the vedas uh, or if there is a conflict between the teachings of puranas and smrutis 
whatever may be sraudan pramanam siyad means pramanik or authenticity relevance so uh, the contemporary relevance is always for the teachings of the vedas and not for the purana samhita stories now bhagavata purana has a unique significance though it is considered to be a purana mythological book it is the only purana which is which has got the same status which enjoys the same status and authenticity with the vedas so idam bhagavatam brahma samvidam so bhagavad purana says that this unique work that we are going to discuss today on verse is as authentic as vedas themselves so those of you who uh, are used to be heard that Pura, that bhagavata is a, just a um, devotional classic so remember it begins with uh, brahma sutra janma disya tah the first statement in bhagavata purana is service the second of the brahma sutra janma disya tah i mean from what from where from whom the entire universe emerges where it sustains where it gets resolved into that is how bhagavata begins and it ends with satyam param jima so bhagavata purana has got an advaitic beginning and an advaitic conclusion so it begins with jnana knowledge and concludes with jnana and knowledge this is the reality but in the in, in, in the in the middle in the in the in the main while what happens bhagavata discusses the teachings of lord krishna and his great personality and his great uh, ideas on how we should live in this world i shall say a few things about the last statement bhagavata purana is essentially a book of spiritual life so how it got this unique significance let us look at the author himself the author was vyasa and vyasa is the one who edited the entire vedic literature and taught each of these vedas rigveda he taught to paila his disciple yajurveda he taught to jaimini so to to uh, vaishambhayana samaveda he taught to jaimini and atharvaveda he taught to sumantu these are four great disciples of vyasa he divided the vyasas into four groups and each of these groups he taught to one of his four disciples so yajurveda was taught to vaishambhayana rigveda was taught to paila and samaveda was taught to jaimini and uh, uh, atharvaveda was taught to sumantu he is also the author of the all 18 mahapuranas and 18 yugapuranas he is also the author of the brahma sutra badrayana sutra and is the author of mahabharata which in its smallest smaller version has got more than 1000 verses 13 times as big as homer's iliad and odyssey and where this n is put together that is the size of mahabharata thousands of characters a scores of dynasties there are hundreds of dialogues you so many wonderful things mahabharata of which bhagavad gita itself is a small fraction this vyasa was suffering from serious depression that's how we got in bhagavata purana the most accomplished philosopher and the fa- most famous sage of ancient times in india the author of the most important classics and philosophical works of sanatana tradition he was suffering from a serious uh, problem of depression he was one day sitting on the banks of river saraswati and his own son shuka was the most respected sage of those days and he had innumerable disciples got already become so well established you can think of a person the most learned man the most the most respected author the most famous philosopher of those days sitting somewhere in a pensive mood suffering from depression suffering from a serious feeling of inner incompleteness 
he was sitting there. The Narada happened to come. The Narada was a great sage of ancient India. So Narada asked him, discussed, what's the matter with you? Why are you unhappy? So you should be happy because if you find a man has got a trillions of dollars in the bank, most wonderful best sellers to his credit, and his own students happen to be the best professors of his time, philosophers, and this man is unhappy. So there is something wrong with him. So Narada asked him, what's the matter with you? The Vyasa said, well, I have done, I have attained, I have accomplished all these great things, but I feel there is a serious feeling of incompleteness, imperfection within me. So I don't know the reason. Then Narada told him, I know the reason why you are unhappy. What, what makes you unhappy? The reason was this. Vyasa had written wonderful philosophical books. And he had, he had uh, uh, written the largest uh, classic, literary classic, the world is, world is now, Mahabharata. Now, in Mahabharata and many of his literary classics, what he discussed was Dharma. Now, Dharma, according to Vyasa, is what you should do and what you should not do. A set of do's and don'ts. It's more like constitution or law. You may be the best attorney in the world, but you may not be the best man in the world. So, Vyasa dealt with Dhrupa Dharma, Raja Dharma, Nara Dharma, uh, Praja Dharma, Pitra Dharma, Madhur Dharma, and so on. But it means, you know, how a father should behave. What are the duties of an ideal father, ideal mother, ideal son, ideal daughter, ideal king? What are the rules for administration? These he discussed in, Mahab, in Mahabharata. Now, remember dharma as Vyasa interpreted in Mahabharata is not the same as the dharma of the Buddhist that you should keep in mind. The dharma of Buddha is something different. It is a, it is, it is a, sub, sub, a sublime, supreme, spiritual, ethical idea. Spiritual idea. But Vyasa's dharma is not, an, not a spiritual idea. It is a constitution of, constitutional propriety is not the only thing that should guide our life. So in the Mahabharata you find Duryodhana, the art villain, almost like Hitler of those days. He himself says, I know what I should do, but I cannot do that. I know what I should not do, I can never stop for a moment from doing that. That is his predicament. So, if you get a good attorney, even Hitler can get scot free from it, you know. So, dharma is a neutral principle, according to Vyasa. Constitutional or, uh, or legal propriety. That is, that is no life. That doesn't teach you what you should do for your own spiritual good. That doesn't teach you how to get inner peace and contentment. So, Dharada told him, you should write something by reading which people will know what they should do for attaining their own inner spiritual contentment. A book by reading which the readers and devotees will know what they should do to obtain their own spiritual goal. Not a, not a, not a legal or constitutional principle. That is totally lifeless. It is neutral, you know. As I mentioned, in the Mahabharata itself, there are great characters like Bhishma, Yudhishthira. Of course, Lord Krishna is the Supreme. They speak one kind of dharma. There are villains also. They also speak their own ideas with full justification. So Vyasa, Narada told Vyasa, your writing, Mahabharata is not enough. That will not set a spiritual goal before humanity. You should write something by reading which they will know 
what they should do in their own individual life, whether they may be householders or monks or professors or factory workers, whatever may be their role in their life, they should have something, they should get something and when they practice what they get, that should give them a kind of inner contentment and happiness. Then only your work will become worthwhile. And as a result, Vyasa wrote Mahabharata. This is the story of Bhagavata. So you can imagine the uniqueness of the book. And I shall give another background. This is closely related to this. Then I will come to the text proper. Vyasa, as I mentioned, he was the father of the greatest sage of those times, Sugar Brahmarshi. So, Vyasa taught this Bhagavata Purana to Shuka. There are many stories, successions, lineages in the Bhagavata tradition. Vishnu taught to Brahma, Brahma taught to Narada, he is called Chadaslogi Bhagavatam, and Narada taught to Vyasa, and Vyasa taught to one of his disciples, Ramakrishna, and he taught his son Shuka. So, the main tradition of Bhagavata is from Vyasa to Shuka. Now, how this book came to be in this form? So, that's what I'm going to tell you. That if you go to any Bhagavata Saptaha, Bhagavata Satram as it's called, you find people reading this, this scripture, with doing, they do puja, they do rituals, and they read this on Krishna Janmashtami, Jir, Jir, and they finish this reading in a very ritual, ritualistic manner for seven days called Bhagavata Saptaham. And Bhagavata Sattra means a series of talks, discussions on topics from Bhagavata. Now, uh, the story goes like this. One day, a great king of ancient India, Parikshit, he was the grandson of Arjuna. So, one day he was traveling in the forest, moving in the forest. You know, in those days, ancient kings in ancient times had a sacred responsibility. They had to look after the, the, the welfare of the saints and sages and hermits, living forest hermitages in the forest. So, Parikshit was going about in the forest. Then, one day it so happened, he got so hungry and so thirsty. He entered a cave. And in that cave, a, an a old man was sitting. He was at the ancient saint with the name Shamika. So when Parikshit entered the cave, the, the cave, the saint was sitting immersed in meditation. So he did not know that this emperor, King Parikshit, had entered this cave, the, 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 the hermitage. So he did not recognize him. The King Parikshit was hungry and thirsty, so he was very, uh, he was very angry when he found that this sage was sitting with his eyes closed, apparently ignoring him. So he got terribly angry. And in that desperate mood, he went, he looked around and found a dead snake lying about in the bush. He lifted that snake with his bow and put it on the neck of the sage and went away. This, you know, the sages in ancient times were retired householders. When householders, after their professional obligations are over, and when they see the face of the grandchildren, they come to a conclusion that a family lineage will be kept intact. So instead of continuing their home, blackening their hair and whitening their teeth, trying to reverse the metabolism, husband and wife will go to a forest hermitage and spend the rest of their lifetime in meditation. This is called Vanaprastasama. So Brahmasadhyasama. Asama. Gahastya Vanaprastasma. And many of the sages were Vanaprastins. So, uh, this sage did not know the Parikshita endured. 
And after some time, his son, Sringi, that was name, his son came to know that a king had endured his father's calamities and had done this terrible thing, putting a dead snake on his neck. And the son cursed, without knowing it was Pariksh who had done it, cursed the man who did it, poor maybe. Uh, he will die of snake bite on the seventh day from now. That was the, that was the uh, curse he made. And when after some time the sage opened his eyes, he found what his son had done. He was terribly sorry that his son who was so immature uh, had foolishly cursed the great say, great king Parikshit. So he sent this uh, disciples to King Parikshit to inform him what his son had done. Parikshit, hearing the sad news that he will die on the seventh day from now, what he did, you know, he did not get angry. He felt, well, he did something wrong and deserved the punishment. That is the beginning of Bhagavata, that is the glory of Bhagavata. So King Parikshit, when he found out that he had only seven days to live, he renounced his kingdom, his comforts, his palace and his family all. He brought his, he asked his youngest, sorry, eldest son to come in front of him, Janemejaya, made him the next king and he left the palace and came to the banks of river Ganga, holy river, sat there on meditation, sat there in meditation and he said he will give up his body as a penance for the heinous crime, heinous sin that he committed by putting the dead snake on the neck of the king. Now when the great sages of those days came to know the whole story and also the greatness of the king, who they got angry, who they punished the sage, but instead of doing that, he was such a great man, he was a philosopher. He had the spiritual insight. That's the difference between a person who is a spiritual seeker, who may commit a mistake, and others. You know, when we meditate, when we lead a spiritual life, we may also commit mistakes, but we will develop an insight into look into our own mistakes in a very impartial manner. So Pariksha could understand that he did something terribly wrong, entering a calamitage, finding an old ancient sage sitting in meditation, he suddenly thought in his foolishness that the sage was ignoring him so, and he committed the sin, so it was wrong on his part to have done it, so he should learn a lesson from this. That's what happens when you become a spiritual seeker. We will be able to throw the flashlight into our own mind. Others will be blind. So, Parikshit was a great man. So, when the great sages of those days came to know of the story, Sukha also came and all the sages, Vyasa, Sukha and other Parashara, all these great saints and sages came to the banks of river Ganga and uh, they, they started uh, admiring Parikshit for his spiritual insight and for his wisdom and his uh, maturity. Then Parikshit puts one question to Sukha. The question is, what should a man do or a man, what should a person do if he or she has only seven days to live? Atha prachami samsiddhim yoginam paramam guru purusha seha yat karim vriyamanasya sarvata. Atha prachami samsiddhim, oh great sage, I am putting this question to you. I have only seven days to live. So what, how should I live my life as an ideal person? Withdrawing all the bank, all the money from the bank, going to Hawaii, or having a good time for the seven days. No. I should prepare for my next level of existence. So, in this life I made a mistake. 
But Dikshu was such a great noble man. He was the, he was the grandson of Arjuna. And he was specially blessed by Lord Krishna himself. He was such a great man. But even a great noble person can at times make a mistake. But the difference is such people will be able to throw the flashlight into their own mind and dictate the problem within their own mind and they will be able to correct it, rectify it. So you see, Atta Prachamisham Siddhim Yoginam Paramam Guru. Mriyamanasiyat Karyam So what he says, Atta Prachamisham Siddhim Yoginam Paramam Guru. Purushasya Yat Karyam. Iha Purushasya Yat Karyam. In this world, which we are going to leave after seven days, which I am going to leave after seven days, how should I leave? So, yakartavyam, yasmartavyam, like that, he goes on asking this question, bhajniyam, what, what, what I should do, how I should meditate, how I should go about doing my duties and responsibilities for the seven days left in front of me, and also what I should not do, bruhi, vidva, vibhadriyam, what I should not do. That is, so what I should do, what I should not. So just imagine a king, a great king, who suddenly confronts the terrible reality that he has only seven days to live. And he renounces his kingdom and wants to spend the rest of his lifetime in meditation so that he will be born again in a situation where he won't commit such a minor. For him it was just maybe the only sinful deed he had done in his life. So, in response to this question, what should I man do if he has only seven days to live? Shuka expounded the whole Bhagavata Purana. Traditionally, he has got 18,000 verses, but many of the available uh, versions have got only 14,000 verses, divided into 12 skandhas. It's called book, 335 chapters. This is the book. So in the next uh, 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 chapter, Shuka begins to give his answer to this question. So the question has got two sections. One part of the question is, Yet Karyam, what should a dying man do if, he has, if death is staring at, his, at him in his, at his face? He has only seven days to live what he should do. Guruhi Yadva Vibhadev, what he should not do. So, the great sage Shuka begins his reply by focusing on the latter part of the question. So, what's the latter part of the question? What he should not do. So, first Shuka gives a long discussion of how people normally consider wealth, status, health, Youth, beauty, external beauty as the only things worthwhile in this world. And how they look upon their own physical body as something that's going to uh, stay forever. Every day you may go to crematorium. If you, if you go to crematorium manager, he will, he will, he cannot actually bring his mind to a realization of the momentariness of the physical body. Every day we read in newspapers, Ahanyahani Bhudani, Gachin, Yahui, Yamalaya, one of the statements in Mahabharata, you find every day millions and billions of creatures, including human beings, leave this world to some unknown place. But we somehow believe we are going to stay in this world for all time. The youth, health, wealth, all this will remain forever. So, Kalidasa, the great ancient Sanskrit poet, has an interesting statement, you know, Yavvanam dhana sambhati prabhuttum dhana mevaca ekaikam avi anathaya kimu yatra chadushtaya Yavvanam dhana sambhati youth, money, wealth and then prabhuttva means you are the law, you are the CEO of a big company or maybe leader of a big group. And each of these can be a problem 
without that spiritual wisdom and spiritual maturity. Each of these can be a big problem in life. So this is how people normally waste their life, without a spiritual ideal to guide them. So one should have a spiritual ideal to guide them. We need not run away from the world, but we should remember the world is not going to be like this for all time. That's enough. That's enough. We should understand its full meaning. Because that particular attitude is called in, in a Vedanta called Rajasri. Rajasri means Jajanastha Rasayasya Rajasaya. The Sankaracharya says, you should be, you should be a blending of, uh, of, of the wealth, dynamism, efficiency of a king and the spiritual wisdom and insight of a sage. If you can combine these together. So how to combine, let's say, contemplation and action. Uh, action and wisdom. Wealth and also the ability to understand its limitation. So that's why, you know, Rajatum Aishirya Sampati Rishittum Tasyaga Sukshmatha Dasana Kshamatum. The meaning is very profound, but it says if you define kingliness, it implies status, wealth, success, efficiency, dynamism, action, all that the world can offer to us, all that we normally consider to be the most wonderful things in this world. That is, that implies kingliness in a in a in a in the language of metaphor. Rishitva means sage the, the wisdom of a sage or a saint, the ability to understand the limitation of material health. So on the one hand the efficiency to generate and manage material success. On the other hand, the ability to understand its limitation. That is the that's what implies, that's what the implication of saintliness or sageliness. Now, implying this principle, Sugha says, we should be able to combine our life. Not only values that make our life successful in the material sense, but also the ability to look beyond what we normally consider to be success. The richest man is not the happiest. And uh, I have seen many people in the Silicon Valley, many people, they come to, I have seen from the many who came from India actually, in the beginning, you know, the, all the great glamour and everything. You know. So I told them, you know, you see, a man like Paul Brendan living in uh, New York is going to Chen, to Madra, Chennai to sit at the feet of Ramana Mahushi who is sitting there staring at something with a loincloth in a cave. And from India they are they are coming here to worship Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. <laughs> so you can see the contrast. Where do you need the, Where do you draw the dividing line? It takes a lot of shocks, a lot of hard blows to make them realize that we should stop somewhere in the middle, in the middle of that, both paradigms. So, Shuka says, Edavan Sankhi Yoga Bhyam Sodharma Parinishthaya Janma Lava Parapumsam Ante Naharayana Smriti. This is the statement. This is how Bhagavad actually begins a spiritual discussion. Edavan Sankhi Yoga Bhyam. So, how to uh, blend in our life action, success, devotion and knowledge that this action and success can really become successful, can really become meaningful only if we, uh, if you are guided by a higher spiritual idea. Now, this you can accomplish either through karma yoga by doing our duty with a sense of sanctity, sacredness, dedication and detachment. Or through bhakti yoga, as we are going to discuss again. 
or Jnana Yoga. So this is the beginning of Bhagavata Purana. The story, the background is something very interesting. It has, some, it has a direct message to our own uh, day-to-day life and activities. Now, the question arises, I, mean, I think in this uh, printed, uh, in the printed paper, there is an interesting journey from belief to experience in Bhakti and Jnana. So that's what we are going to discuss. Because you have already printed, I have to do justice with these words printed here. So how do we travel from belief to experience? How do we cover the distance? How to how do we bridge the gap between what we want to do and what our mind permits us to do? Very often, you know, there are wonderful things that we would like to do. If our mind would permit us to do whatever we want to do, there will be no problem in the world, really speaking. So how to bridge the gap? So Bhagavata Purana gives a series of ideas uh, to solve this problem. From the bhakti standpoint, from the devotional standpoint, it uses the word prapatti or saranagati. And from the jnana point of view, from the philosophical point of view, it teaches us to look upon everything as an expression of the divine principle. So normally, people practice devotion. We may begin by practicing devotion just as a ritual. We may practice meditation for a few hours in the morning or every day a few hours and we may sit about one day for spiritual life or maybe a few hours every day, a few minutes perhaps every day for spiritual practices. And then the rest of the, our activities we may often brand as secular or non-spiritual. So, uh, the devotion begins uh, with some kind of dedicated, punctual, time-bound practice of certain uh, spiritual discipline. That's how we begin. But as it reaches higher level, what happens, you know, devotion should end in a, in a total surrender to the will of the Lord. Really, devotion begins to be effective it begins to help us in our life only when we reach this stage. This stage is called, the devotional philosophy is called Prapatti or Saranagati. So, uh, when such a person uh, reaches the highest level of devotional experience, then what happens is, he is free from all kinds of negativity. Not that God will come and solve all your problems, but we will be able to look at our problems from a higher perspective so that these problems are no longer problems. In spiritual life, we don't get answers to our questions. Our questions cease to be questions. Questions are no more questions as we evolve, as we transcend. That's why uh, there is a great uh, famous verse in devotional scriptures. Yesi anugraha michami tasya vittam haram megam bandhavaista biyogena prisham bhavadi dukhidaha tena dukhena sabdhattu yadid nama parityaji tam prasadam karishyami yad devai ravi sudurnaham. You know, I have one problem. Without quoting these verses, I cannot speak really. Ideas won't come because first this these verses should come. Then only ideas can come. I cannot write. So, that this verse is very profound. You know what it means. If God wants to help you, if he has a special privileged position for you, if he has a special grace for you, then what he does, you know, he will start giving you a lot of problems. You may ask the question, this is not a very pleasant way of showing grace 
But if God really wants to show you his special grace, he will not keep you lazy. He will not make life a bed of roses. He will continuously give you problems. So, yes, I will steal his wealth. That is a literal meaning. Means people may, devotees may find problems like poverty. And then Bandhavaisa Yogena, he may be completely isolated. Sometimes, you know, wealth can make us proud and arrogant and we may become completely forgetful of any higher value in life. This could happen. That's a problem of wealth. All people who are wealthy may not fully be aware of the limitation of being wealthy. The problem of being wealthy. You know, Yavvanam Dhana Sambhakti. So, youth, wealth, Prabhutu means overlordship. And many oldies by themselves can be a big problem, can be a big precipice. If these good qualities are not accompanied by some higher spiritual insight. So, when a good devotee becomes completely forgetful of higher value, spiritual values, God will take him into a pop. And then, when he is surrounded by wrong associations, wrong types of people, who will be a, who will bring a disaster in his life, will be a big source, a big problem in life, then you know what? God will get you isolated. And in spite of all these problems, if a devotee doesn't take his mind away from God, then he will be lifted to the highest degree of spiritual perfection. You can find any number of such examples in Hindu tradition and maybe equal number of examples you find in the Christian mystical tradition. Most of the saints got only post-mortem recognition. But look at the life of the great saints, Saint Teresa of Avila, Saint John of the Cross, or the, of the great uh, mystics of Russian or the Rock tradition. You find any number of them. So how did they get the ability to withstand the persecution and the challenges in spiritual life? We should ask this question: Where did they get this strength, this ability, this power, this determination? to withstand the challenges in life, these great devotees of God in non-traditions. Because their devotion to God gave them a special spiritual energy, which was actually the fuel that enabled them to move forward and gave them the strength to withstand the obstacles and challenges and unpleasant experiences that many of the great spiritual saints had experienced. So that's why this idea that every spirit, every spiritual seeker, a spiritual devotee, will have to face problems. But those problems are only a, 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 an expression of the special grace from God, so that our devotion will become strengthened, our spiritual life becomes sublime. So. Uh, you can find many examples in the coming days. I shall give you very, very interesting examples. And so now, if you want interaction, I must uh, I'll be, I'll be happy to respond to some of your questions. You are welcome to ask any questions. This is the beginning of this session. Swamiji, uh, in terms of timeline, uh, the Bhagavata Purana comes later than the Mahabharata. Yes. So Bhagavata Purana existed in a different form, uh, even 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 in the uh, 9th or 10th century BC. But it took the pres its present form, literary form, it, uh, only 
around 9th century AD actually. Because uh, one, one important way of judging uh, is uh, historical historicity. It is not quoted by the great Vaishnava teacher Ramanuja, who himself had coined the Saranagadina, Anuvulli, Sasangalpaga, Pradivulli, the definition of the property surrendered to God was done by Ramanuja, but it never refers to Bhagavad Gurana. Shankaracharya, uh, who quotes from every conceivable spiritual work of those days, doesn't quote from Bhagavad Gurana. These are some of the arguments put forward by scholars and linguists to show, or to prove that the present Bhagavad his present shape to, uh, 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 is a later origin, but it did exist much earlier. Yeah. Bhagavada, if you say Bhagavada is a very modern book, is wrong. But Bhagavada, as we find today, in his present shape, may be comparatively modern, compared to Vedas or Mahabharata. You find the style of the yeah, yeah, yeah. The Anushtuk Chandra is one style, and there are different other. Yeah, there are complicated, complicated meters. Uh, so why it happen like that? Because it, 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 Bhagavad Gita, Panditya Parikshana, Bhagavad as a literary classic, is of a later origin. So in Sanskrit poetry, the, the, the general trend is the more modern, the more complex and complicated. The more ancient, the simpler. Mm. So you find, for example, one of the one of the uh, uh, simplest poetical works in Sanskrit is also one of the oldest, Valmiki Samaya. Mm. So, Kurnus means Sampradam So it's just like modern, just like modern, just like, modern, just like uh, simple uh, uh, poetical classic. So Bhagavada is much more complex and complicated. You find many, uh, many uh, li- uh, classical literary works belonging to 18th century or uh, 19th century are much more complex. In fact, one of the greatest uh, poetical works in the Bhagavada tradition is Narayaniya, which was written by Mayor Patu Narayana Bhattavari. In 16th century, late, early 16th century, it is one of the most complex it uh, works and, you know, it, uh, it, it displays all possible uh, skills of a great scholar, linguist and grammarian, which he was. So it belongs to comparatively modern times, you know, six, early 16th century. So, but the original uh, works of uh, either Mahabharata or even the Valmiki Ramayana are all very, very simple. Please. Well, is there a recommended way to study the Bhagavatam? Excuse me? Hmm? Is there a recommended way on how to study the Bhagavatam? Yeah, uh, those who uh, those who are not familiar with Sanskrit language can get, can read an English book called Regunathan's translation, two volumes, like like a, you can read like a story book you can read. There is no Sanskrit slokas. Sanskrit verses in between. Those who know some Sanskrit and want to study with the help of uh, translation, Tapasya this publication translation is very good. So I would uh, I would recommend a, any either of these books for readers who want to study. And those who want to study Bhagavata uh, from a very devotional point of view can read the Bhagavata Studies, you know. There are a number of hymns in Bhagavata. Uh, by Brahma, by Dhruva, by, uh, you know, by, by Deva Studi, or Deva Gist. There are many, many hymns. Studi means hymns, devotional hymns, you find. Do you recommend uh, Vita-based or Atman Mahavajas or Thomas as a for repository of everything? Who, who, who? It's called database.com. 
who who is called yeah many many organizations have done it so the anything that is that appeals to you that gives you a feeling of inner spiritual um, you know broad mindedness serenity this one so there are many organizations who have popularized this so there are say, there are also some pictorial versions they brought out which can which can be very instructive for example uh, respect for uh, our neighbors respect for parents and respect for teachers uh, all these great values you find in the characters of bhagavata purana so these are being popularized by many organizations of different levels So the the core, as you said, of Bhagavata is really this element of bhakti. It's a bhakti yoga, yeah. and how you attain charanagati. Yeah. So talking about moksha swaroop yeah. and kind of Shankara's work, and he was initially a very much of a jnana proponent, jnana yeah. yoga. Yeah. But later on, he did compose, you know, stotras like Bhajan Govind and a lot of different stotras for different gods, yeah. uh, propounding the bhakti aspect as well. Yeah. Yeah. My question is. Uh, does bhakti in itself lead to uh, the ultimate sarva jnana, uh, the Vedic union? Yeah. Or bhakti is like a precondition which gets you to a place where you are now ready for the knowledge. So uh, again, uh, if you remember in the 70s, uh, Sri Radhagopalacharya in his state on Rajagopalacharya says, uh, Jnana without bhakti is useless in so that's the word he uses. Yeah. Uh, Shankaracharya himself mm-hmm. writes in his commentary on the the, the 11th verse of the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Maicha Ananya Yogena Bhaktira Vibhijari Vivikshva Desha Sevitum Anabhidjana Samsara. In this verse Shankaracharya defines pure devotion, sublime, pure absolutely, undiluted, unwavering. So, Adhivijarini Bhakti. And he goes on explaining it is uh, unchanging, unwavering, steady, achala, nirmala, sutta, etc. And then he says, Sachaknana. Sangraja says, this purest devotion, undiluted devotion, a devotion that we mentioned, Prapati, that devotion takes you uh, to the stage where you identify yourself with the Lord. What you meditate upon, you realize within your own heart. That is a kind of Advaitic experience. So at the highest level, Bhakti and Jnana are the same. That is what Sankarajaya says, Sacha Jnana, this purest, most sublime, undiluted devotion, most exalted devotion, is jnana itself. So, uh, as a means, as a method, for a sadhana point of view, when you are a spiritual seeker, you may, according to your temperament, you may perform rituals, you may per, you may chant hymns, but when you reach the highest experience level, these differences vanish. For Shankaracharya, he is the author of the of 65 most profound devotional poems in Sanskrit language. Now, if you take any other bhakti acharyas, I don't normally compare, it's, it is unfair, but none of the bhakti teachers could ever write anything comparable to what Shankaracharya wrote. 65. On Vishnu, Shiva, Shakti, Devi, Kumara, Subramanya, everyone. You cannot go to any temple anywhere on whom Shankaracharya had not written at least one key. <laughs> and this man was teaching the whole world for Advaita. So what he did, you know, he, on the one hand he taught the highest Advaita Jnana, the most sublime spiritual philosophy. That's like the top of the hill or the top story of the building. But he gave you a ladder. You are standing below. 
he can take this land and he can reach there. So Shankaracharya is like a big sheep. So you find in Shankara's work and his life, you find some instructions, for some methods, some, some guidance for the beginner and also for the most exalted spiritual seeker. If we go to uh, if we go to any of these places, I went to Bahamas or a retreat, you know. Bahamas is not, not a likely place to go to a spiritual <laughs> retreat. <laughs> now, Bahamas, they have got one of the most wonderful uh, yoga training centers in the world, started by Swami Vishnu Devanata. They are learning Brahma Sutra, reading English, English translations. They are learning Advaita books. People who can't People who are, there is not one Indian among them. They need to drive home the point. All from Europe, America and other countries. We go to Himalaya, you find eh, the number of students coming from all over the world to learn Vedanta. Now, what attracts the most uh, 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 exalted intellectuals of modern times, Hinduism, Advaita Vedanta, Sankara, but at the same time, you find he also wrote the 65 uh, uh, San, uh, devotional poems. One of the poems, you know what it is? Chadu Shasti Bajara Puja Stotra. It is a hymn which outlines 64 types of rituals in puja. It's the most articulate, most elaborate exposition of ritualistic worship. Coming from Shankaracharya. And who installed temples all over India. Not only from Badrinath all the way to other Gedanath places. He established temples all over India. He went to one Shiva temple, uh, uh, one, one uh, mother temple. Going to Kanji, he wrote Sundari Lehi. To Sri Sailam, he wrote Shiva Bradakshamavana Stotra. He recited. Standing in front of the deity. So, the greatest Advaini can be the greatest devotee. That's it. Another point, you know, when you become an Advaini, when you reach the highest jnana, you don't deny anything, you don't dispute anything. If you are a great professor, you won't tell a kindergarten child, oh, you are a fool, you are studying only alphabet. Look at me. If you are a real professor, he, he, you will know that you also started like that one day. And he may reach where you stand right now. So, uh, Shankaraja himself is the first great uh, Advaita teacher who clearly stated in his own Bhashya, so when he said that means, Sanjaknya, the highest devotion, Abhyabhijarami Bhakti means the most sublime, the unwavering, the unchanging, the steady, stable devotion is jnana, knowledge itself. So, there are a few more things perhaps I can mention to you about Bhagavad Puranas, a special work. Now, you know, I, I mentioned earlier Puranas. So, Bhagavad Purana you find. There are certain special characteristics attributed to Bhagavad Purana, which cannot be uh, attributed to other Puranas. Normally, Puranas are, uh, are, are, are defined like this. Sargascha, Pradisargascha, Vamsho, Mannan, Tiranicha, Vamsha, Nujaritantika, Puranam, Panchadakshana. Panchadakshana means every Purana, all Puranas have got these five characteristics. Five important characteristics. Puranas describe the origin of the universe, gradual evolution of the universe, the stories of dynasties, kings and emperors, stories of great sages and saints and mystics, and also how to worship the Lord. All these, uh, uh, this, you know, this self surrender, all these great teachings are normally included in Vishnu Purana, Siva Purana, Devi Purana, Kurma Purana, all Puranas. But Bhagavad Purana has got eight, sorry, ten characteristics. Atrasargo, Visargrasya, 
స్థానం పోషణ ఊతైన వంశాన్ని జరిగిన జైవ సో అత్ర సద్గు విసర్గస్ట్ స్థానం పోషణం ఊతై సో వాట్ ఆర్ ది స్పెషల్ క్యారెక్టర్స్ భాగవత పురాణ సో వన్ ఈస్ ఇట్ డీల్స్ విత్ ఒరిజిన్ ఆఫ్ ద యూనివర్స్ ఎవల్యూషన్ ఆఫ్ ద యూనివర్స్ దెన్ హౌ ద వరల్డ్ ఈస్ బీంగ్ రెగ్యులేటెడ్ ఇట్ మెయింటైన్ సస్టైన్ బై ద లాంగ్ the grace of the lord and how the law of karma operates in our individual life and different dynasties different ages different eras and also the story of great saints and mystics and sages and also uh, the concept of liberation and the concept of self surrender to the lord all these are explained in bhagavad gita so uh, that is a special characteristic atra sargo visargascha sthanam poshanam mudhe okay so you find uh, we will in course of time we will discuss this one after another in course of time so any more discussion yeah. uh one thing you said just really struck me it was so beautifully uh, uh put forth when one is surrounded by problems yet the devotee does not forget god he or she will be lifted up to the highest yes. it's so profound yeah, yeah because uh, really you know when you confront these problems your mind becomes so completely pure if uh, we are not ready for the highest grades we will withdraw when there is a problem so the problems are a purification yeah yeah mitigating the karma yeah. Yeah. yeah in the bhagavata purana there is an interesting principle like this connected to this so then you get to mention they see devotee people turn to god when they find the logic of a normal human logic doesn't apply in life see in life in 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 a laboratory mathematics or physics or in laboratory 2 plus 2 is 4 if you put all chemicals together you get identical result whether you do in siberia or where you in texas there is no difference who does it where it is done identical conditions identical experiments identical results so there is perfect predictability total predictability you can determine but in human life it doesn't work if in our life this mathematical logic really work we won't turn to mysticism poetry music or religion or god so we find a kind of kind of inconsistency and unknown unpredictability in life so we look for a meaning and explanation that's how a normal human being begins his spiritual journey now when this journey goes over you fail this is the beginning but then in the beginning of spiritual life you may think oh now i turn to god everything we want to for but it's not going to be so the transition from 0 to 2 or transition 0 to 1 is so strongly felt but the transition from 1 to 9 you may not feel the transition you get established so during those days we go through different difficulties uh, different problems which roughly uh, call, may be called the dark night of the soul uh, you know it is the unknown difficulties but these difficulties are essential prerequisites for you to evolve to a higher and higher level of spiritual life you can think of uh, uh saint joseph who was born in cupert you know the italian saint he was a very dull a humble man um, and he was working a stable boy you know in a and then everyone everyone in the monastery tried to deride him and they finally bishop showed some grace and he was then he uh, he he actually got a broken image of virgin Mary. which he uh, and he meditated 
and uh, prayed to that Virgin Mary and he could levitate. That's how the story goes. And then it so happened that he was finally uh, uh, allowed to appear for an examination and, but he used to pray all the time. So, uh, when the examination hap- uh, took place, what happened? They asked him one question, the only small portion of the Bible which he had memorized. <laughs> that is the only thing they asked. Said, uh, they said from St. Luke 1, uh, let, you know, the story of uh, uh, if you, uh, if you uh, if one land is lost, you leave 99 behind and go after the lost one, you know, that story. And so he became the patron saint of students preparing for examinations. <laughs> because he, the only thing he knew about the Bible, which he always used to repeat in his mind, was so dull, was this small, tiny fraction of the, of the paragraph. So you find, now what enabled him, because he was already praying, so all obstacles were removed from him. But he would not have prayed with so much intensity, he had a good time in the monastery. Everyone tried to drive him away. He had a lot of problems to face. So those problems forced him, compelled him to pray with greater intensity and that made him a greater saint. Okay? But please ask me, you wanted to ask something? You wanted to ask something? You wanted, I think you were... I did. Oh, no, no, I just wanted you to do what you did. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely. So we shall conclude today. Uh, we can we can come, uh, we'll continue tomorrow. Om Shanti 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 Hari Hari Om Krishna Sri Ramakrishna Krishna.